What's up everybody, Justin Conoco, another episode of Prime People and longtime friend and client Peter Rocca is with me and Peter is one of the owners of Start.ca and if you're not aware or you're living under a rock, Start.ca has taken over the game locally in terms of telecommunications. Um, Peter came to us with a problem that he needed solved and that's one where your company is growing super fast and you wanted to create a whole bunch of new jobs in London but the real estate that was available was very restrictive, the zoning uses, the development charges, the whole dynamic of the commercial real estate transaction was not something you had time to deal with, right? So we sat down with us, we went through all the different Communities. possibilities, right. yeah. And we, I mean, we talked to local yeah. builders, we talked about, I mean, Kellogg's was one that we went after and looked at, and the economics of that project didn't make a whole lot of sense. And then we found this site on York Street, um, and the reason that this episode came up was because Peter was, you know, we were sitting down last week talking about something else we're working on and he's like, hey, I got to take you through the building. And I'm like, well, why don't we get our videographer to come through, shoot it because of the fact that these guys are doing things that are so high level and it's rolling through really quickly. I'd love to s let you guys locally see what's happening in your community because you drive by these buildings, you see the vehicles going in and out, but you don't really get to see the inner workings, right? So we're going to pull the curtain back, let Peter kind of speak on that from a higher level perspective. I'm gonna drill him with a couple questions that I've been kind right, of curious right. about. Yeah. Um, Pete, there was one thing I wanted him to show you on the outside of this door that I've never seen before in a commercial building and it was the face scanner to come into this space. So what does that look like or, or why did you choose that? How does it work? Right, well, I mean, one of the things, so this is data center. So this yeah. is where people can bring their equipment in. Uh, so businesses that are looking at uh, being able to put their equipment in a you know a facility that's safe, uh, secure, it's got high capacity, uh, power redundancy, cool redundancy, uh, and connection to the diverse carriers and stuff. So that's what a data center kind of is: is to be able to take that stuff out of your, you know, out of your closets and your, uh, you know, might have a computer closet or sometimes yeah. literally a closet in some of these places. Like server racks, right? Server like you're racks, talking yeah. people that have large data requirements. You're right in a hub. And you guys are offering that service that they can bring their stuff yeah, in here. Yeah, so okay. right from small, like so, yeah. a single server is literally sitting under a desk. I've seen that. I can't tell you how many times. <laughs> uh, to multiple racks of, of equipment, we can handle it all. So that kind of huh. you know, facility needs that kind of security. And so what we have is called three-factor security. Three-factor security is uh, uh, something you are, something you know, and something you have. And okay. So uh, in our case, we use the something. I forget what order. I just said them in, but yeah. uh, you know, you have an access card. Uh, you are your face and yeah. you know your PIN code. And okay. so what that does is prevent someone from impersonating you or finding a card somewhere and being able to access a facility. Mm. So there's many levels of security actually come through the building. So on the external wall, uh, it gets you into the uh, vestibule here. Yep. From here, you have the three factor. And then once you kind of move in through the facility, different areas have different restrictions. So some of them you just need a card, some you need a card and a PIN. Um, but basically we've kind of authenticated who you are so that's what face scanners for. Make sure you are who you are. That's wild. I'll have these guys shoot the face scanners so you can see what that looks like. I feel like I'm in the movie War Games where they're like going into the bunker yeah. to get into it, right? But it's yeah. crazy. Like I've seen what this building was before you guys got your hands on it. I'm excited to see what it looks like inside. So take me on a tour. Yeah, so it was a pretty exciting repurpose. This used to be a metal, a metal distribution plant. Okay. Um, and we really stripped it right out of the walls, yeah. upgraded all of the systems, the power, the cooling, uh, generators, security, um, and of course the fiber, uh, you know, which is the fun and exciting part. Uh, so what the, when you did the fiber, like, and so you got the building back to a shell, right? And I remember it was an industrial warehouse. Yeah. Um, you know, the city of London, when we worked with them initially, th this is just an interesting thing that the audience should know is, you know, you sit, go to planning, we give them the application saying, you know, we're gonna repurpose this industrial site, turn it into an office complex, and bring a whole bunch of new jobs to the city. The first response we got was no, it doesn't fit the official plan, which was the challenges that we can deal with in real estate, right? Thankfully, we're able to sit down and kind of work through the kinks of that and find ways to make it work because this is a phenomenal project for the city and we would have hated to see you had to go somewhere else. But that said, you're going from an industrial use to you know, a high tech use. So when you're laying fiber and you have a base building, what does that actually look like? Does it look like the Jarvis that you installed at the other building, dropping in a huge <laughs> cube and then running wires out of it? Like, Yeah, well, I, I mean, just a lot of moving parts yeah. in the building. And, uh, you know, I felt actually, I felt that, you know, the city, well, they said no initially. I know they really wanted to say yes. Yeah. And I thought they really worked with us. They were great. trying to find a way to, to say yes. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different phases. So the, the piece that we're in today is the data center piece. And uh, that's the big cube with lots of wires, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, and then the second phase is the commercial or the, uh, 
the office space that we were talking about. So okay. basically this space here is 40,000 existing square feet. We're adding another 4,000 through a three-story um, uh, building that's yep. gonna kind of tie into everything. And then that's where our whole team is gonna move after. Uh, so this piece here is kind of the, the core infrastructure that we would have needed not only for um, providing the service, but for our own facilities as well. So we're not just a, a data center. We need this stuff for our own stuff as well. Yeah. And then we just make it available. Location is pretty key too, right? Being like right central in the city, you can fire any direction and, and get access to it. It's almost having like your own compound within downtown, but then you're also turning into a campus for the employees because culture is a big thing for you guys, Absolutely, right? Yeah. Like from day one, I mean, if I called what you guys did a call center, I would have been thrown into the yeah, river. Yeah. We're not allowed to use that word. You're not, that's the thing, right? And like dealing with you guys, like obviously we used you at our office for fiber optics. And I remember like we were in one of the oldest buildings on Palm Mall, like the old bell lines run all down Palm Mall, right? And they were great when they came to the hookup. They called me back after like, I think an hour of us actually using the service. They're like, oh, how are you? Like, how's it going? And I'm like, Dude, amazing. Like just, just the caring aspect of it, like an actual human being. Hey, there's a, yeah. a concept in yeah. Versus, yeah, it <laughs> seems really simple, yeah. but you just felt like there was somebody I could call, right? Like a, a mechanic you trust or somebody that you could just call and be like, hey, I'm having this issue, can you take care of it? Go and handle your business, come back, and it's actually taken care of, or they follow it up versus they just don't call you back or you're on hold for four hours, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's what we're, I mean, yeah. that's that's really, you know, how we differentiate ourselves is the our customer experience. And, um, you know, we, we use the Ford friendly all over the place. And, you know, I know that when we went through the rebrand, that was actually something we really learned is, you know, the experience people had versus the experience they thought. And so we just decided to kind of take that experience and change our brand to, to fit. The experience people are already having but yeah at the heart of everything is, is really our core values and, and friendly is right up there uh it's people um you guys are doing a great job with Thanks. that but let's go inside and you can show me the rest all right so uh we can show you the exciting room or the not so exciting room this is the uh the room actually where all the fiber comes into from different vaults okay uh, through the area i want to see the not so exciting room i like that all right well stuff, let's so. look at the not so exciting room and i'll i'll just guard my pin here top secret <laughs> all right Hope it's clean, uh, clean-ish. Clean-ish. All right. Uh, so we have two, of the, one of the things in, in uh, running a redundant data center is you have two of everything. So this is one of what we call our meet me room or fiber meet me room. So this is where fiber comes into different vaults that are on different areas of the, the property. Okay. And then we have another room that's similar to this, a little bit smaller, uh, that connects to some other vaults as well. So that when we have fiber come in and connect to different areas of the city, if there was like some sort of, you know, extenuating disaster that, you know, impacted one area of the building, it wouldn't impact the, the facilities on the other. Oh, okay. Additionally, this is where we bring in other carriers. So you can certainly use us for internet service and we, we hope that you do if you're here. Um, but we are, we're called carrier neutral. And so that means the, the Bells, the Rogers, the Teluses, the Zeos, and Hydro One Telecom uh, all have the ability to interconnect with okay. uh, our customers here as well. So if you need some services from us and some services from them, uh, this is where we come and meet uh, those carriers uh, back to your equipment. Cool. So basically, these conduits are going through the ground uh, into different vaults. So these these conduits here. These, these are the conduits. These conduits go out to different areas of the property. And this is the actual fiber optic. Cable. This, this so this is this is what we would call a sheath, or this is an outside okay. uh, cable. So it's it's relatively sturdy. It's got a lot of cladding in it. Yeah. Uh, but basically, yeah, that's the outside. So if you see the outside wire coming in. It comes into this, which is called, uh, it's basically the frame or the optical, uh, optical, um, sorry, it's an outside plant okay. frame. Yeah. So this is basically where we transition the block cables, those outside cables, which are really rigid and, and uh, much more hardened yeah. uh, into inside uh, fibers. So these are, well, flexible. Uh, looks like the guys are working on some splices here. So oh. basically these are the, the actual fiber optic cables here. No, so these, this and they all have sheathing, and those are made of glass, you told me, right? Once we're yeah, so these are made out of glass, and actually what we're seeing here, each one of these, which you can see is incredibly thin, Yeah. Uh, actually the vast majority of this is the plastic around it. So the actual That's uh, center of the, well, my eyes are, are getting pretty bad, but you're not going to... Like, gonna you, you can it. barely even see it, yeah, and you're so talking that. like... So terabytes of data, right? Exactly, like, yeah. So this is like thousands, each one of these strands will hold thousands uh, of times the capacity that even the fastest connections that most businesses or homes have. So, but we had lunch that one time and it stuck with me. Like I wasn't educated on fiber optics, right? We were talking about you're like it's glass. Just so glass. like data transfer on glass. I'm like, how fast can it go? It's like 
how fast do you want it, right? Like, I mean, people are, they're downloading movies and if they don't download within five seconds, they're annoyed. And it's incredible to see where the technology is gonna go and if you can have that capacity to turn it out to whatever you need, it's almost like you, you're building the infrastructure now for the technology versus what we've dealt with for the last 20 years, which is like compounding technology increases on an infrastructure that can't support it, right? Yeah, so I mean, if you take a look, you know, a very short history lesson would be, yeah. you know, the telephone lines and the coax lines are kind of the traditional technologies. One was designed for low bandwidth phone and the other one was designed to, you know, uh, unidirectional uh, sat uh, cable TV, TV service. Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of, you know, uh, technical innovations that allowed us to repurpose that kind of technology to put internet over. Um, and you know, there's been but it wasn't built for it. It was never. I didn't know. It was that. always built for telephone, always built for, for cable. Huh. So it was all about leveraging an existing infrastructure that had been planned for this whole internet thing. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of technologies and what they were doing was using the existing infrastructure in the ground and basically changing the electronics at either end. So hey, you know what? Instead of broadcasting, you know, cable, you know, through this analog signal through this coax, hey, if we change the receiver and the transmitter on either end, we can do something. With that physical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the same thing is with fiber, except the difference is that fiber was designed for data technology. Uh, but even the same infrastructure, the same cable that was in the ground for 10 years, um, and the stuff that we're putting into today, you know, if you look back 10 years and go all the fastest speeds were, I don't know, remember the exact date, well, it's called a gig or 10 gigs of, of capacity, super, super fast. But with that same fiber, no change to the infrastructure, which is the the hard and laborious and expensive part is putting fiber to Open the, the ground, right? Open the ground, exactly. Yeah. Putting in conduits and pulling fiber through it. Uh, it's just changing the, the technology at the end. So just like your cell phone gets faster and faster every every year, yeah. the transmitters and receivers become much more efficient about sending technology. So those same fibers that might have only been able to transmit one or 10 gigs before are transmitting thousands of gigs uh, now without, just, just by changing the electronics on either end. So the stuff that we're putting in now, we can deliver, you know, 100 gig technology now, but 10 years from now, that could be 100 terabits. I mean, you know, it's funny to think of that now and being like, wow, that's a lot of information, but with how quickly it's gone up until now, there's no way of knowing what the requirements are going to be or where technology is going, right? Virtual reality, augmented reality, you know, just people's actual needs. Like we've seen a, a bounce back between Wi-Fi and people wanting hard wired coax cables or hardwired Cat5, Cat6 and fiber optic connections in their offices, right? Because they're doing a lot of video editing like this guy shooting right now, I'm sure. <laughs> he needs it now, right? Like when he's processing, it's the time is money. And I, I think the efficiencies of the system are gonna need an infrastructure in place, um, which is kind of the next thing I wanna talk to you guys about, about high level you know, infrastructure and what that looks like yeah. for you guys. So we'll go into the next Yeah, phase. let's go into the fun right now. So I'm going to blast you through kind of a fire round of the spaces yeah. we just went through um, so you can kind of walk people through it. So we went through this main area, we went to the not so fun room that I thought was a super fun room, just digging into fiber optics, the data center, um, like high level, the data center that you spoke about earlier, and I'm going to tell a lot of my clients about it that, you know, instead of them worrying about server rooms and generators and backups and stuff like that, what I got from you walking me through that space was it's turnkey, right? You guys, I mean, give me some of your background as far as when you used to do the lacing and the installing and what sure. you did with that space. Yeah, um, so yeah, you may, I mean, I was a guy that, you know, we've been in a lot of different data centers uh, across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I've been the guy that was racking the servers and, and being able to use the space. So everything that, you know, I've learned over the last 20 years um, and our team has learned over the 20, past 20 years about things they like and don't like in other facilities. Yeah. I uh, really helped to uh, kind of design this one. So here we do like extra wide wild aisles, which seems like, you know, a, small, a simple thing, but instead of a two and a half foot or three foot, what's called hot aisle, which is where the hot air is blowing out of the back of the equipment, uh, we do four feet. And mm -hmm. because, you know, you're in the back, you don't want to be like all squeezed in and yeah. you have the ability to move around. Equipment um, won't get damaged as much too, right? I mean, if you have a bigger person oh. that's working on equipment and then they, they jank a cable, they're trying to put yeah. in systems, I'm sure that factors in too. For right? sure, and I mean, even uh, even trying to pull something out of a rack that's on rails, you know, it, it's just a lot easier. Four feet makes it so much easier. So four foot hot, four foot cold, uh, extra wide racks as well. So the cables Absolutely. like in your racks are not jammed up at the back, you got a lot of room. And it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. But from like an infrastructure standpoint uh, as well, you know, everything that 
know, it's fully redundant. So what's called 2N power, which is, you know, the, the, the power plugs that go right to the equipment, you know, are connected to their own uh, bus bar, to their own distribution. You know, all these are separate and isolated. Uh, back to their own UPS, back to their own generator. So it doesn't matter if the UPS fails, the generator fails, the bus bar fails, you always got power to your cabinet. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, fire suppression. You know, really I was going to ask you about that, yeah. right? We saw those two big red canisters. Yeah. That's pretty crazy because it's not a fire extinguisher hanging on a wall. Quite. No, 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 not exactly. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, you don't really want a fire, yeah. you know, going off. And so uh, there's two types of systems. One's uh, what's called a, a fire protection, and that's typical spring players, and you have to have that for life safety reasons. Uh, but we have what's called fire suppression, and that kicks in way before there's, you know, flames and stuff to be able to... Um, uh, melt off those heads and spray water because yeah. you don't want that. So these systems, these gas-based systems, inert gas-based systems, essentially flood uh, the space with an inert gas and, and steal the heat um, mm -hmm. from the fire being able to start. So those systems are incredibly expensive, um, but really what it does is make sure that, you know, even if your equipment was to malfunction or something was to spark up, that it'll be, you know, within seconds is extinguished. Uh, and the, the stuff that we use, instead of the kind of standard FM200 stuff that a lot of people use. We went with a little bit more expensive, a 3M mm -hmm. product called Novak 1230. Okay. And it's, uh, you know, the benefit of it in, in terms of not only being way more environmentally friendly, you know, if, if it goes off, uh, basically, like within a few days, uh, it's like it never happened, whereas mm -hmm. the other stuff, it's like decades uh, in terms of ozone depletion. Um, but also the other added benefit is if you're in the room and it goes off, uh, you don't die. That's is, a good thing. It's a nice yeah. thing, yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's human friendly as well as environmentally friendly uh, and very, very effective. We, we were talking a little bit kind of off camera again about how, you know, what I was really impressed with and one reason why I wanted to shoot this video, you know, was watching you guys project manage and plan over time, right? Like even that, like the fire suppression, serves a purpose and it's an infrastructure based thing that you made a decision on early on, you could have saved over on that effective cost by going with the standard product that everybody else uses. But it looks like you had more of an idea of where the industry was going and, and factoring in, you know, being conscious of the environmental choices that you're making and the people, right? Going back to back the back crux back. of what yeah. we talked about, about the, yeah. the people mattering more than anything else. And I mean, you treat your people well, they're gonna do good work, customers are gonna feel it, it just creates a good environment, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, we always wanna do the right thing, make sure that obviously the service is reliable and dependable, but at the end of the day, uh, you want your people to be safe and yeah. they're gonna be doing good things for the environment. And one other thing that I know I want this guy to clip in and with some of the B-roll is the conduit work that was done. Like, you know, you pointed that out, like it's, yeah. It's easy to see people running conduits here and there, but I mean to see how perfectly done, like yeah. top to bottom, it was. was it, it's a real, it's a real art. You know, yeah. the, the gentleman, the, the key guy that was doing a lot of the big pipe bends, uh, he's obviously been doing it for a very long time, and for him it was just, uh, it's art. You know, yeah. the, being able to bend in multiple directions and still have every pipe run parallel is just, it's, uh, it's a thing of beauty. Yeah, it's hard to find good people like yeah. that. I mean, we deal with trades right all the time. Yeah. And, Good electricians and people that are able to do things like that, they're they are definitely worth their weight in salt. And you do it right the first time, you're not coming back in two years and having to rejig something because all of a sudden one condiment went wrong or something along those lines. So when we left that space, we went basically from like the data center and something I need you guys to know, I'm gonna tell you myself if we're ever talking, is they have that ability, which I didn't even know you were doing, to put all of your data centers here, right? Instead of worrying about server racks and everything else, you've got that here. And just like we were talking in the beginning of the video about the commercial real estate transaction, how you just didn't have time to deal with it because you're running a successful company. Same thing with people that are running companies right now. You don't really want to take the 10,000 hours it's going to take to learn how to set up your server room properly, how to run your redundancy systems and everything else. It's already here for you. So one reason we kind of wanted to expose you guys to this is you're driving by the outside of the business or, and don't even know that inside is the future as we were kind of all joking about, right? It feels like, we're in a movie right now, which is crazy. Um, but we went from the data center to kind of the main building where you're going to be putting in the offices. So give me a snapshot of what that looks like. Yeah, so uh, we're excited about that. It's uh, a pretty open uh, environment, but at the same time, a lot of kind of spaces really to facilitate different types of work. So different kinds of meeting rooms and different kinds of um, you know, we call them havens and coves and stuff to be able to do work when you need some quiet time. But really trying to keep um, the collaboration and communication of the, the team as, as open as possible. So we went through actually an exercise with a consultant uh, here in town who really helped us walk, work through how does our business work together? You know, what are the types of activities that are people doing? Um, and really finding 
you know, how do how do we design that space so that um, you know it was effective and supportive the kind of work that we were doing. So we've kind of got you know our on the main level we've been doing a big recording studio which is actually pretty cool. That's one of my I guess next pet projects that yeah. I want to do because uh, getting into TV we're doing some uh, we want to get into community TV station as well. Okay. Uh, but we do a lot of recording of our own blogs and videos and support stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then in there, we've got, you know, a really big staff in the 80s area, uh, building kind of a lounge and a gym in, in uh, the old uh, brick building there, and then rolling that into kind of a, like a big open, uh, we call a plaza area um, that's got a bit of a stage, but also you know, lots of hackable tables that people can move around and we can repurpose. And then I think our HR team and our field team um, are uh, on the one side, and then moving forward, we've got like our... Uh, sales and a marketing team, uh, this one, you know, and then we have another floor which is our service delivery team, and we've got a, another floor which is our kind of developers, our networks, and our systems people. Again, trying to find ways of uh, teams that work together collectively mm -hmm. uh, being close to one another and giving them the environment for them to succeed. Right, and so I still feel like their community. That's kind of the vibe I get walking through that space yeah. as you're laying it out. Is you want people to feel like you know they all have their own workstations and pods because I mean sales versus development, but two completely different things. Some people want quiet areas, some people exactly. want an area that's got a different energy to it too, but the, the facilities all tap in. That was your vision that you said at the beginning, was a campus, right? Like an area exactly. where you've got everything at your disposal, it's segmented, but close enough. And that's the fun part about working in a place like London is, I mean, when I, we're walking out, I see the Millennium Project that's happening behind, I see downtown London steps away and it, it's all, it's all integrated, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, we actually have another offering that you guys are doing with the little restaurant portion that we'll talk about in a separate video, but it's, all, it's cool. Like it, it's nice to see that you guys are keeping it local and kind of building it up from there. Um, you know, the renderings that these guys have for the space that they're going to be building out will blow your minds. Like you're going to drive by this place in five years and not even, you'll go on Google earth to see the old photos and you'll be like, well, they tore down the building and they put up an entire new one. Right. But, yeah, it's, it looks really nice. The architect uh, firm really did a great job of capturing that video and giving us a lot of, or that vision and giving us a lot of really good ideas. And mm -hmm. I'm really happy with the, what the finished product is going to look like. The last thing I want to talk about, so we talked data, we talked high level, what you guys are doing, talked office and community. And then we saw Megatron at the other side of the building, <laughs> these two gigantic generators, the locomotives. The locomotives. You talked redundancy and power, redundancy and power. Like, what are those all about? Yeah, so those are uh, our generators. Yeah. So they're diesel generators. There's two of them, of course, yeah. for redundancy. Uh, and each one of them is 1.5 megawatts. Okay. Uh, so it really uh, has not only the capability of powering all of the data center and all the equipment that gets put into that data center, but mm -hmm. being able to power the entire building. Uh, so we want to make sure that our team, you know, if somebody's calling in, that you know we're able to still answer phones and use our computers and the power failure, et cetera. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, just you know they're all really big investments and part of the infrastructure, but just part of you know that whole delivering that whole uh, package. So because I'm not gonna steal all of your time, I know you probably have somewhere to be right now. The last thing I want to touch on is like the TV. Yeah. So I mean, you guys built this from the ground up, telecommunication wise. You're you're right there. Anybody looking for internet and and that aspect knows that you're there, you do the data center thing, TV's an undertaking. Like yeah, with, you know, adventure. That, what does that look like? like how do you just wake it looks up like day? two years? <laughs> That's what it looks like, no. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, we, we knew we needed to get into TV, you know, our customers have been asking for it. But for us, because we're doing so much of this infrastructure and fiber work, it's really important for us to be able to deliver a TV product. So when we go into apartment buildings and mm. we want to wire the apartment building and get fiber to all of the tenants in there, um, it's really a much easier uh, conversation if we're able to deliver, you know, phone, internet, and te television as a single package. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, when we're running fiber through, you know, residential neighborhood, it's really expensive to go through all the effort of putting fiber into the neighborhood and running it down without actually connecting the house. So yeah. really the TV kind of helps us drive that fiber adoption and really make it a no-brainer in terms of, you know, getting connected to fiber. So two questions for you. Um, first, high level. Like, so say you're running fiber into a neighborhood and I own an apartment building and I have a house in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. What do I have to do to have you hook up to my property? Um, give us a call yeah. and we'll talk to you about it. Yeah, so houses are, we don't generally do like a one-off on house. We'll go okay. through and do an entire neighborhood. Is it like pre-development neighborhorhoods or existing neighborhoods? Both, yeah, okay. so we'll go into new developments. Those are the easier ones for us. We go, we do what are called joint trenches and yep. we get in there while the ground's all torn up. 
Um, but if we're going to come do uh, what's called an overbuild or a brownfield, which is when we build where there's you know houses have been there for a while, uh, we'll coordinate the whole neighborhood and then do the whole neighborhood. And so what we do is a little bit of a campaign, uh, letting the homeowners know in advance that you know if we can get a letter of permission to be able to run not only um, or basically to run the conduit on their property to their uh, to the side of their house, even if they don't connect with us, if we're able to do that construction at the same time, they'll save them. So measure 50 bucks or something like that later okay um, because all of our, our team is there and we've done all the locates and permits so it's much more efficient for us to do them in the uh, so you'll, the you'll actually run the fiber to their properties because you're there anyways correct versus if they call you four years later like hey i want it because now the future's here and i need it you'll be like well now it's a 750 dollars bill because their team's not actually there yeah. right and, that, and that's even if we can still yeah. get it done so uh when we come through a neighborhood even if you don't think you need it now if we get yeah. that letter of permission uh we clean up the mess after and you never even know we're there and uh and that way your, your house is ready for the future so the letter of permission is basically what needs to be signed is there any additional costs on top of that or is it project by so it's free yeah okay same with my if i own a building say on a commercial building downtown you want to run fiber we just need to have a conversation. We bring it in, doesn't cost the, the uh, apartment builder anything. Okay. Uh, we will work with them to make sure that it's gonna look the way they need it to look. Yeah. And, uh, but we do really good work and really clean work. They do, they've done lots of <laughs> buildings with people that we've worked with as well. You know, they, you call us been like, hey, you're working on this building, we've gotta get through. And it's funny, because everybody thinks somebody wants something from you. They call you and say, hey, I wanna hook up to your building. They think, well, I'm gonna get a $50,000 bill, or I'm gonna get this, or I'm gonna get that. I mean, that this is probably one of the best pieces of value this whole video is going to give is people to let them know that that, that is available to you now, but once the infrastructure is built, they may not have the ability to do it, or there may be additional costs. From a real estate perspective, it adds a ton of value. If I know there's actual fiber connectivity to a building, that can mean you're getting or not getting a 30,000 square foot tenant that needs that infrastructure in place. Um, I forget what the numbers are, but there's so much research that shows not only the, the value of the property. and the, I feel like it's something around fifteen or sixteen hundred bucks a unit is yeah. what the incremental value is. Uh, but even just in terms of uh, additional rent, you know, so for the properties that are not uh, condominiums or, yeah. or uh, owned by the least, um, there's also an uptake. And again, I don't remember what it was, but I think it was like eight or ten percent people are willing to pay to have fiber um, as a premium for rent. So it really does add a lot of value to those apartment buildings. And you know, we have got a great team that you know will come out and talk to you about what it looks like, and then we have a great team that will come out and actually do the work. And they're friendly. Yeah, that's, we're friendly. That's what they built their business on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Easy to work with. So the last piece, just give people a resource if they want to learn more about start.ca, the TV stuff you guys are doing, is website, is it, what's the best way for them to reach you guys? Yeah, our website or give us a call. We okay. love talking to people. Um, and even if you don't know who to talk to, give yeah. us a call and we'll put you in touch with the right person. So. Awesome. All the information is going to be below in the comments and the notes will run the actual number on the screen. So you guys, that blows my mind. In this day and age, when I say, where do we send you? I mean, we do these interviews all the time. It's like, go to Instagram, go to Snapchat, go here, go there. It's like, call us. So I mean, that, I think you guys are where the puck is going in that sense. Um, I feel it even in, in my world where people hide behind email and, and you know social media and don't actually connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. So you guys are doing good work. Appreciate your time as always, Pete. All right, thanks. Cool. Right on. Thanks. That was awesome.